G'day, I'm Jeremy Wish and today we're going to talk about thermal time and axing. The development of many organisms can be measured as a function of temperature. Well, no, this notion isn't new, it was uh, documented in the middle of the uh, 18th century and this concept underpins many simulation models. Basically, the cooler the temperatures, the slower the rate of development of both insects and plants, making development a function of temperature. The way we often measure this temperature, or at least bring it into a calendar day type situation, is by accumulating the average daily temperature for each calendar day. So basically, maximum temperature by the minimum temperature and dividing it by two. As you can see in the spreadsheet below here, I've calculated the average daily temperature or day degrees for each day and then I've accumulated those um, here and that's the way that we can measure between one uh, part of the life cycle and the next part of the life cycle or one of the phenology cycle of the plant. Um, calculating average day is the simplest form because plants and animals quite often won't grow or develop in um, colder temperatures. It, uh, we, for some specific plants, you will end up having a base. And this is just a, a floor to the amount of temperature that is accumulated. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, why do we do it? Well, if we use calendar days, here's an example from a bit of work I did uh, a few years ago. The G's, these first lines down here, are all Gatton, which is a, a fairly warm part of Queen, uh, Queensland, compared to Canberra, which is a colder part of uh, Australia. You can see here the same variety. Took about 130 odd days to get to flowering in Canberra where it was only taking 70 days in Gatton. When we put that over a thermal time basis, you start seeing that they all line up pretty close together. You've got these two here that are a bit shorter. They were given additional day lengths, uh, 14 and 16 hours of that light, so they were a little bit different to the others. But generally, once you put things over thermal time, you remove the problem that of them growing slowly because they actually grow the same, or they develop at the same rate. If we look at a, a temperature log, this is a temperature log in five minute intervals uh, for a site um, down actually near Canberra, not apart from Canberra. Um, this is a September five minute catalogue and you can start to see how we have cool mornings, temperature rises during the day and then it'll cool down overnight down to the early morning. So, we would need huge MET files if we were to have this much detail. So I guess in a way of compressing, we tend to just provide people with the maximum and minimum MET file of, a, of, a, of each day. And from that, we can calculate our day degrees by simply getting the average between the two. If we did take the average of that whole line of the, at the five minute intervals, you find that we actually get a slightly different average than when we just took the maximum and minimum. It's not so bad in this day, but you can see here there was a bit of a difference. And if we start to accumulate that, over time you can get quite distinct differences. So, how do we understand and get those shapes and, and not and account for some of this loss? There's a few different ways and there's one paper by Wilson which is quite an old paper but it, it had this beautiful figure which I've used to, to help me describe it. You can see here that we've got our, our daily temperatures and here is where we're just taking the average day. So we're just chopping straight through there and we're explaining it. There are other mathematical methods. The sawtooth approach is used to try and 
account this to account for the higher temperatures and the lower temperatures during the night and day. The single sign, this is basically a method, this is very similar to what is used in APSIM, and we'll get to that in a sec, uh, which helps describe the, the shape of the day, and again the double sign, which does it slightly better. More, recent, oops, more recently, there are some other papers that have gone into more as computing power's been improved, people can downscale or, or take that uh, maximum minimum temperature and create much better or closer relationships to what the real day is worth. But today we're talking APSIM, and so let's look at this day here, and let's look at what, it, what APSIM would do with that maximum of 14 and a minimum of 4. It would spread, create a, an eight segment, so we work in three hourly jumps. You can see here, I've just put these as a linear from one to eight. They're not actually trying to reproduce the day, but you can see the temperatures we're getting is our maximum at point one, and then we will move down to our minimum at point eight. Um, we take those and we calculate the average daily temperature from those, and that's how um, APSIM works. The uh, equations and everything for it are from Jones. That's a, a pretty old piece of uh, work, and I'm sure there are much better ways to do it, but all of APSIM Classic uses this approach. In APSIM Next Gen, there is the option to um, use some of the more detailed methods Though, so if you are building a crop in AppSim Next Gen, you can start to uh, to explore and use some of these more detailed methods. Certainly, some of the disease work that we're doing, um, we're looking at using better breakdowns of sub daily time steps. Okay, if we looked at a day a bit before. The, one that, the first one that we've presented, it was a bit colder and we got down to about minus three. Um, in that day, here we will start talking about the, base, the idea of base temperatures. APSIM uses a base temperature of zero for many of its crops, many of its winter crops. And for those in the Northern Hemisphere, I guess I should correct when I'm saying a winter crop, it's a crop grown in winter in uh, Australia, which is basically a spring variety. Um, if we look down here at our base temperature, so we use a base temperature of zero, uh, you'll see these points are included in our calculation for thermal time. So only the points within the envelope are, are counted. If you look in your what I'll call your INI file or your um, AppSim XML file, you will see that there's a, uh, for each crop, there will be a thermal time calculation, and it's usually describing this envelope in this way. So you will see that um, in this case, no development, you know, we start at zero, uh, we can develop up to 20 degrees and we will get 20 thermal time units, but when we get to 35, we're back at zero. So we're not accumulating any temperatures above 35. Okay, so that's the temperature window. Here's another way of describing that exact same picture. If we look here in, uh, and this is generally how you will see it if you're looking at AppSim Next Gen, you can look at the, the, the figures and they will just describe that, that envelope. These ones are both base zero crops. If we look here at maize and cotton, maize has a base of eight, uh, cotton has a base of 12. So all that's doing is lifting the floor of that envelope and saying no development will occur in those lower temperatures. Okay, so it's all handy to, to know this, but if you're sitting there and you're trying to work out what you can do with your data and how do I get a thermal time? One method is you can run AppSim and get that, and you can run it for each crop to get the exact uh, envelope around it. 
But if you're playing around in, um, if you'd like to play around with it, we've created this little shiny app. Once the app has opened, um, and I really have to give all credit to Jody Biggs for putting this app together for us, you can have two thermal time en envelopes to compare. So in this case, up here we're going to look at X1, and we'll put in the thermal envelope for wheat. So for spring wheat, 0, 26, 34, and so that's wheat, and we might do canola as well as X2. So that would be 0, Two helps if you type the right numbers. Uh, 30, 35, one, two, three, zero. Okay, so once that's done, we can set a starting time. So we're going to set the 1st of May as our starting time. And we now need to load a MET file. So I'm going to load um, a MET file from Wagga Wagga in uh, central New South Wales, um, possibly southern New South Wales, Australia. Um, and we'll, now that's loaded, if this is only, uh, this MET file is in AppSim format, it's only a three year MET file. So it loads quite quickly. If you are doing this with a hundred year MET file, this next stage, when we're doing all the calculations, will take a really long time. As it is, it still takes quite a while, so I'm trying to think of things to say while we load, while it uh, goes through and calculates for every day in this three-year MET file and produces this sort of figure. So basically what we're showing here is the average daily temperature, which is this black or grey line. Uh, we have the results from function one, which is what we set up to be our wheat uh, function, and our orange one, which is our canola function. You can see that there's not a lot of difference early on, and that's particularly because it's, this is an Australian winter, and so the temperatures are consistent between both, pretty well between all of them. It's only when we start to warm up that the, the caps, the temperature cap on the envelope, starts to cause them to separate. Now, some of the work we've done on canola has suggested that it really should have a, a, a base. So if we experiment, and we'll throw in a base here, so that will become 28, because uh, we've taken two off there. So now if we run this one, and again, we have to wait while it uh, calculates over those three years. So you can see if you have a, a hundred year MET file, it's going to take a long time. So the pur purpose of this is more just looking at single seasons. And once we get that result, you start seeing here how our canola or our um, second function is accumulating thermal time at a much slower rate than the, using the average daily temperature method or by using uh, or the weak function that we've left. So there's this highlights that when um, you're looking at people's work or when you are publishing any work, it's really important to describe exactly how you calculate the thermal time because it doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to everybody. And certainly if you're trying to uh, compare things to AppSim, if you're trying to compare between thermal time between stages, having something, understanding how AppSim is calculating the thermal time, as well as uh, looking at how the paper you're referring to or the data you're referring to make it calculate it. Once you've got all of that together, you, and you can click on the data file. Here you've got a whole sheet with all of those thermal times added to it and you can simply download that in um, Excel format or CSV format, and that will, uh, you can then read into R or Excel or whatever you want to uh, experiment or play around looking at the data 
uh, in more depth. Thanks for listening. I hope that was useful.